This video gives an isoparametric element example, working through finding, finding the Jacobian and then determining the B matrix. So here's the element that we're going to find a B matrix for. This element is in the XY or global system and it has not a standard shape, but a not atypical shape for elements in finite element codes. So we have the nodal positions for the nodes in this element, and what we're going to do is use those to define the transformation back to the natural coordinate system, and then use that transformation to determine the Jacobian matrix, and from that, the B matrix. So let's go. Start by defining that mapping. The mapping is where we say x is equal to the the x vector is equal to the shape function matrix times the x capital x vector which is the nodal position so you see in the upper right the capital x vector is x1 y1 the positions or the x and y position of node 1 so that's 3 1 and then 5 2 for node 2 5 5 for node 3 and 2 3 for node 4 that's how the capital x vector is set up the lowercase x vector is the position of a point where the s and t coordinates are in the natural coordinate system and the x and y are in the global system. So this mapping gives us the one-to-one -one correspondence between a point in the st system and the same point in the xy system. When we write this matrix equation out as a scalar set of scalar equations, we get that the little x, so the x position of a point in the xy system, is the shape function 1 multiplied by the x position of node 1 plus shape function 2 multiplied by the x position of node 2 and so on similar for the y component or the yes the y component of a point in the xy system so now we plug in the specific numbers for this element here's where this transformation becomes specific to this element the formulation looks the same for every single element in our model but each element has different nodal positions, and those are reflected here in the expressions for x and y. What we're going to do is use this expression along with our known shape functions defined in terms of s and t in order to determine what the B matrix is. Along the way, we're going to have to find the Jacobian matrix for this transformation. So again, here's a quick overview of what we're doing. We have this element in the xy system, and we have a master element in the natural coordinate system that every single bilinear quadrilateral element references. What we're doing by defining this mapping with little x equals n times big X is we're creating a one-to-one -one correspondence between points that are in the S and T coordinate system. We're linking them to corresponding points in the X and Y system. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking that ST coordinate system and we're mapping it into the XY space on our element. So for a bilinear quadrilateral, we know that the B matrix looks like this. It has partial derivatives of each of the shape functions with respect to X and Y. But we also know that the shape functions themselves are defined in the S and T coordinate system. This is the power of using a natural coordinate system is we can do all of our definition in that ST system, but it does introduce this complexity when we have to get to the B matrix. It will get simple again when we want to find the stiffness matrix because it means that the integration will occur in the S and T system. So we've got this relationship that we previously developed where what we're looking for is the derivative of each shape function with respect to x and y and that's going to be equal to some matrix we're calling the inverse of the Jacobian or j minus 1 multiplied by the derivative of the shape functions with respect to s and t. Now the derivative of the shape functions with respect to s and t is known. The derivatives with respect to x and y is what we're looking for. The Jacobian matrix itself is given by the transformation that we just developed. So we know what x is in terms of s and t, so therefore we can calculate dx ds and dx dt. And similarly, we know for y that um, what, how y is defined in terms of s and t. So we can find dy ds and dy dt. The shape functions themselves, just a reminder here, that's the, uh, the ones shown here on the screen. In order to use this um, chain rule of, uh, approximation, so to find dn dx and dn dy, we need the inverse of the Jacobian, but we also need the partial derivatives of each of the shape functions. 
So that's what we're developing here. The derivative of n1 with respect to s, derivative of n2 with respect to s, and so on. So we're going to need these in a moment. I went ahead and developed them here. We'll come back to these after we find the Jacobian. So let's find that Jacobian. Again, here are our shape functions. Let's work through the definition of the mapping. So we already said that x is equal to the nodal, the x coordinate of the nodal positions multiplied by each of the shape functions. So 3n1 plus 5n2 plus 5n3 plus 2n4. You can look over at the sketch of our element and see that 3, 5, 5, 2 are the four x positions of the four nodes. Now I plug in the shape functions from the top of the screen there, and I get this full expression. I'm now going to multiply out the terms, and then I'm going to gather like terms, which gives us this final expression 4x. Now that's a good thing to hang on to. This is going to give us that mapping back and forth between x and the s and t coordinate system. But what we're looking for here is the derivative of x with respect to s and the derivative of x with respect to t. So I've done those derivatives. I've developed those derivatives. These are now two of the terms that we need to get to the Jacobian. The other two come from y. So let's go back to y. So again, we know that y is equal to the y coordinates of each of the nodes multiplied by their respective shape functions. So 1n1 plus 2n2 plus 5n3 plus 3n4. If you look at 1, 2, 5, and 3, you see those are the nodal, the y coordinate of the nodal positions of each of the nodes. Plugging in what each of those shape functions is equal to, and then multiplying out the terms, gathering like terms, we get this expression for y. So again, this is an important equation, but it's not quite the one I need. For the Jacobian, I need to go take the derivative of y with respect to s, and then with respect to t. All right, so these four partial derivative expressions are the ones that go into the Jacobian. So here are those four terms that we've defined. Now, we want to plug them in to get the Jacobian matrix itself. When I do that, we end up with this for a Jacobian matrix. Now, we also want to find the determinant of the Jacobian. Now, careful when you make the determinant of, when you take the determinant of a matrix, if there's a coefficient out front, that coefficient is multiplied by every term in the matrix, which means that if we leave it out front, we're going to have to square it for a two by two, two matrix. It's probably safer if you bring it inside before you find the determinant, then you won't accidentally make a mistake and not square or cube a term for a two by two or three by three matrix. This is our expression for the determinant of the Jacobian. We simplify the terms and we get one eighth S plus three T plus 14. That allows us then to calculate the inverse of the Jacobian, where for the inverse, we are swapping the two diagonal terms, putting a negative sign in front of each of the off diagonal terms, and then dividing out front by the, it, by the determinant of that matrix. So that is the inverse of the Jacobian, which we're now going to use to find the partial derivatives of all of the shape functions with respect to x and y. So here's the expression we're using. For each one of our shape functions, we'll apply this shown matrix equation. So we're going to take the derivative of the shape function with, re with respect to s and t, put that into the vector on the right-hand side. We'll use the inverse of the Jacobian, which we just found, pre-multiply that shape function derivative matrix by the inverse of the Jacobian, and the result will be the shape, the, the shape function derivatives with respect to x and y. So for shape function one, here's what happens. We've got dn1 dx, dn1 dy, that's the vector we're looking for, is equal to the inverse of the Jacobian matrix multiplied by the derivative of shape function one with respect to s and with respect to t. Now we've done those derivatives already. The derivative of shape function one with respect to s is minus one quarter, one minus t, and the derivative with respect to t is minus one quarter, one minus s. So we multiply that vector times the inverse of the Jacobian matrix, but we'll leave the coefficient out front for right now. So we get now a vector. This is what we expect because we're getting a vector on the left-hand side. So we have a vector with two rows and simplify that a little bit and we get this for our vector defining the shape function derivative with respect to x and with respect to y. 
So this is giving us two specific terms that will go into our B matrix, dn1dx and dn1dy. So that will fill out the left two columns of the B matrix. So we repeat this process for shape function two, three, and four. So again, this is what the B matrix looks like. As you can see, the first two columns depend on derivatives of shape function one with respect to x and y. Those are the two terms we just found. The rest of the matrix depends on the other shape functions. I've gone ahead and did that analysis separately. I'm not showing you that process here. It just repeats the same process we just saw for shape function one. So shape function two derivatives look like this. Shape function three looks like that. And finally, shape function four looks like those. So you can see we're dividing all of them by the same factor as you might expect because that came from the determinant of the Jacobian. That's pretty typical. That term will show up in all of the B matrix terms. So now if I plug each of those terms into our B matrix, it gets a little bit large, but this is the B matrix that we have as a result. The B matrix is equal to one over the quantity s plus 3t plus 14, and then it has each one of these terms inside the matrix. It will have a total of eight columns and three rows. That wraps up this example. The next step here would be to take this B matrix and put it with the D matrix inside of an integral in order to find the stiffness matrix. We'll look at that in a couple of videos because we need to talk about how we're going to do that integration first.